Hello and welcome to the Ethnic Podcast. Today we have three very talented CTOs with us. Uh, first, Roger Campus from Kamalu. We also have Albert uh, Belonk uh, from Kipu. And we also have Paul uh, Ramon Revilla, uh, the former CTO of Redbooth and the current CTO of Factorial. So, uh, welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today we want to try to shed some light uh, on some questions concerning the CTO role. Uh, many people are, are wondering uh, what, what are you guys doing in, in, in your work and uh, how to become one. I actually, when I when I wrote you the the mail uh, inviting you to this podcast, I, I wrote I think the title was "Undressing a CTO uh, and How to Become One." Uh, and yeah, we won't undress yeah, you. I, but I, was, I was a little bit uncomfortable with that title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But it will. Will be uh, will be very low key. All clothes will be remaining uh, on, uh, but uh, we will try to uh, you know get under your skin uh, and 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 try to uh, understand uh, you know how to become a CTO and and how you be, you became one. So I think we can start in, in one end. Uh, we have you, uh, Albert. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been the CTO of Kipu how long? I th- well since we started like three years ago. Three years ago. Over three years ago. Yeah. And so you you just stepped right into the the CTO role from the beginning. Um, not really. Uh, when I well after I was studying, I was studying abroad for a year and a half, and I got back to to Spain and I was uh, wondering what to do. Uh, and I started at Ethnic uh, as a developer, uh, actually uh, uh, under uh, Rugia CTO. And after some months, uh, Camalun uh, started out like really big. And uh, both Kamalun and, and Bernat, uh, founders of Ethnic, uh, went to went to Kamalun, and I started as CTO of Ethnic. And then, uh, after I would say two years or yeah, two years and a half, maybe uh, I started Kipu from within Ethnic. Hmm. And and how was it going from being a developer to, to becoming a CTO? What, what how did your role change? Um, well, as uh, it was like going from uh, one developer to two developers and three and so on, it was not that big of a change. It's more a, a gradual one. So uh, yeah, responsibilities grow and you take care of more and more uh, things. Maybe you start uh, not coding uh, that much, but it's not that big of a change. So, uh, Pau, you yeah. you, uh, you recently started a new company here at Ethnic called Factorial. Yeah. I guess we will hear about more more of that later on. Uh, so. <laughs> but uh, you, you're the former CTO of, of Red Booth, uh, a great company here in Barcelona and also in the US. Uh, tell me a bit about how you became a CTO at Red Booth. Yeah, so I... Uh, I was uh, initially just working there. Actually, I was living uh, on the coach. Or, like, I was just living on the coach of the founder's uh, house in San Francisco, <laughs> and I was coding uh, for for that couch. That was my salary back then, so I was not the most expensive developer. <laughs> uh, and then eventually, uh, it didn't work that well for me in San Francisco, and I decided to go back. So I decided to keep working for Red Booth. And eventually, uh, Jordi, who was the CTO back then, he decided to move on with another project of his own. And then I was suddenly promoted from developer to CTO. So I think I was quite lucky. Uh, but at the same time, I also leaded teams before. And for very similar reasons, the former <laughs> tech leads uh, left. So uh, I'm always in a situation that somehow I managed to find myself <laughs> on the, uh, filling the gap. So all right. <laughs> so you're the, you're the guy that's filling the gap. Yes, I'm the fill. I mean, this time, this time at least I started as a CTO. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a bit different now. All right, all right. <clears throat> and uh, last but not least, uh, Roger, you, you've been the CTO of Camaluna a while now. Uh, can you tell us yeah. a bit about you? You're also a founder member of, of Camalun. Can you tell me a bit about how your mm-hmm. your role has yeah, you know, changed over time? Well, it came very naturally uh, because I was in the company from the beginning. Uh, the first, uh, we founded Ethnic with a partner with Bernat because we both 
We are in the same university, um, studying uh, web technologies. Um, and then we decided to found a company, and I took responsibility of the technical part, because that's what I liked the most. And since there was no one else in the company, I was the CTO, because I was the first developer. And I never wanted to become a CTO as a goal, as per se. I just wanted to, to start the company, to learn new things. And in the beginning, I was the developer. And it's always the same. You have a set of goals, of objectives uh, to accomplish, and you keep accomplishing them. Uh, when the company is small and you have only two, three, five persons, you are the one that develops and does everything. As the company grows and more people get involved, you have more developers. You have the same objectives, but the ways and tactics you need to manage to fit that goal, uh, that's what changes mm -hmm. over time. Hmm. Yes. Uh, I was the city of Itnig, and then mm, when we met um, Pere Rius, and we decided to start a Camalun, a new company. Uh, I was then the city of Camalun, and Albert became the city of Itnig. Hmm. Hmm. Filling the gap as well. Filling the gap. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, like, initially you didn't want to become a CTO per se, and now you're the CTO of uh, a pretty big group of, of developers that's continu continuously growing, you know, mm -hmm. every month. Uh, how is that? It's difficult to grow them, <laughs> but yeah. we expect to do our best, yes. Yeah? It's very difficult to hire uh, good developers. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And, uh, something that, that I've been wondering, at least, because a CTO, you know, uh, you're the chief of, the, of all the technical parts moving in, in the company, but, but still you're a leader. So, like, your daily tasks, uh, does it, is it a lot of, of uh, you know, coding still, or, or is it just administrative, HR? What do you say, Pau? You, you've been uh, the head of a yeah. big team. Well, I mean... Right now it's a lot of coding because I only have to manage myself, so yes. that's pretty convenient. Yeah. Uh, but it, it depends on, on the stage. So I think as you grow, you have to dedicate more uh, more time to the human side of being a CTO. But also different people have different skills, I mean, uh, and different styles as well. There's people that prefer to keep coding a lot, there's people that get totally not involved with coding, and they get more involved with management and so on. I I like to keep a little bit of everything. So I like to keep coding and try to understand what's being done and how it's being done. But I also like to uh, to help a lot the team on the human side, to do a lot of one-on-ones, to, to also try to understand as much as possible what management requires from the development team and so on. I read I read uh, somewhere you wrote, wrote in the Red Booth blog that uh, you you should do you think it's more important to focus on the team even more than your product itself. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I wrote that I think two years ago. I may have changed a little bit my way of thinking, but one thing that keeps being true is that uh, depending on the company, but uh, most of the times uh, your development team uh, may be the biggest asset. So if someone will ever acquire a company, uh, your technical team will wait so much, it's gonna affect so much evaluation that it's probably one of the biggest assets you can invest on. Sometimes even more than the product. It, it depends on the company though. Hmm. Did you agree? Uh, you yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Huh. And yeah. you as well? Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, coding, uh, the most important thing is that it all depends on the stage of the company. Mm. When you start, you have to code everything. And right now in my current situation, coding is not my most critical thing to do, but I keep doing it to keep my mental sanity <laughs> uh, and also as a way to keep being involved in the code itself. Uh, because many times it's hard to keep track of everything that everyone develops. Not at a feature level, but more at the technical uh, point of view, I mean, maybe someone doing one feature introduces a new uh, generic library or a new generic way of doing something and uh, want to keep uh, hmm. knowing these kind of things. Hmm. But the most important thing right now for me is uh, talking with people, either in meetings or in formal chats or emails or, or Slack, Right. whatever right. it is. Huh. Uh, but it's about talking with people, in with everyone. I mean. In my team, it's about uh, 
passing the vision about the software because in the beginning you code it yourself everything so you need to re you don't need to respond to anyone else uh, but when more people get involved and other technical persons are working on your project it's no longer your project alone it's from everyone now and then if you want to keep your goals i mean this software has to be uh, that way you need to transmit that uh, vision to all the other people that are coding. So, but you've been a CTO for a while now, and you said you, you code to keep your sanity. So you really miss <laughs> you really miss coding, or In, yes, yes, not so much coding because uh, I'm I am involved in the technical decisions more or less uh, with all of them, but I don't code explicitly all the solutions. But this is coding. Coding for me is thinking about the solutions, the architecture, uh, etc. Not not writing uh, to a file. No? In that sense, I am still involved in, in coding. Uh, but uh, what I miss the most is uh, having time to explore new things, new technologies. Because I realize now that uh, I, I I can uh, spend uh, the amount of time necessary to keep up with uh, React, uh, Elixir, and many other mm. things that uh, are mm. interested. Now. Mm. But you, Albert, you, you're pretty involved with the development and encoding yourself still? Yeah, still. But uh, as time goes by, uh, this is changing and changing, and uh, it has been changing for a while. Uh, I still code. I, I have um, developed some big chunks of, of uh, features or uh, some big refactors or something uh, uh, interesting lately, but this is uh, changing as also we are growing the team now. Uh, we are going to be five people at the end of the year, uh, so uh, I, will, mm, I will quit uh, uh, doing that much coding. But mm. Yeah, it's. You look forward to your development team growing and and. Not yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely to that. But you, 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 but you will be more and more like a, you know, a HR HR boss or uh, more than a technical. Yeah, I think that this is a bit what's going to happen. But it's, uh, I guess, it's a natural. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, a I, natural next just, step. Just, just an interruption. Yeah. I wouldn't call it HR boss. I yeah. think in the end you keep being you keep being an engineer, All right. and what you have is an engineering problem right. that you have a certain amount of uh, of people, and you want to optimize how they can produce as, exactly. as maximum as possible. Right. So in the end you do a lot of oh these people this person doesn't get along with this one, so when they work together uh, it doesn't they don't produce uh, anything good, or this team is really productive when they do this or that or you know how can you release or test things so in the end you you just have to think about uh, about your team uh, as a uh, as a system and you want to optimize you're an optimizer hmm. you try to reduce friction you try to optimize their happiness and for their productivity hmm. Yeah, oh, that's, a good, that's a good way of putting it. And and moving on to the developer part, uh, we talked a lot about you guys, uh, but uh, all of you are, are hiring uh, or have been hiring. Uh, uh, what what do you look for, Albert, when 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 you hire a new developer? You you've been in the process right now, and you are in the process right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, this well as of now, as uh, how the situation is uh, right now in in uh, well in Barcelona or or most of the the uh, hotspots uh, where mm -hmm. where technological companies are, is hiring uh, absolutely. Uh, there's uh, so many companies uh, looking for people, and and there's now so many uh, talented people that uh, you would like to be. Uh, that you would like to be in uh, in your team. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look for people that I can rely to, that I can um, pass something big and I can quite forget about it or I don't have to uh, think about it uh, every day so I can just talk uh, about it with, uh, with that person. Um, it's uh, not only talent uh, in order to um, keep up with uh, changes in technology and so on, but also there's this uh, human uh, human part, like uh, uh, to be able to, to rely on someone, to, mm. to be able to uh, 
um, coordinate uh, a team that that works uh, as best as possible. So someone that can take on a lot of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Yeah, and do you do you agree, Roger? You are also always always hiring as well for your development team. <laughs> is is there any particular? Uh, is like what kind of technology do you feel it's easier and most difficult to find great develop developers for right now? Mm, Ruben Rails is one of those, <laughs> definitely. The hardest. But it's not about technologies, but more about uh, skilled people and experienced people. Right, right. Uh, I look, most of the most important thing is motivation, because that's what defines the, the person. If that person is willing to learn new things every day, and if this person is willing to go deep in every time he has a problem, and he doesn't know how to accomplish something in, in, in their job, uh, this person needs to be able to face the challenge and uh, research whatever it takes uh, to understand uh, the final result, not just do the job. Hmm. Uh, because that's, why, that's the path you need to go to learn new things. Right. And then experience. Um, what experience that this person had in the past hmm. because uh, maybe I found many people that has uh, one year experience uh, repeated five times because they work maybe in a marketing company that makes websites for clients mm -hmm. and this person is making the same thing over and over uh, and this person never reaches a, a deep understanding of what web technologies are uh, because he never reached a point when the person has to face complex problems, complex enough problems. Uh, and then cultural fit uh, is another good one, because you need to be sure that the person you're hiring will be uh, working together with the rest of the team in a good way. You know? Right, right. So we have a lot of events here at Itnig, and I talk to, I talk to developers personally every week, mm -hmm. and, and uh, some of them are, are looking for, for jobs, and they say that but everyone is looking for, like the coolest jobs, everyone is looking for a lot of experience, a lot of experience, the young ones are telling me this. And, uh, and they're, they're telling me like, how, how, like, how can everybody looking for, for like a lot of experience? And you say that, uh, is, it, is, it, is it a mistake for a developer to take a job, that, as you say, like in a marketing company, you know, and, and get you know, the wrong kind of experience? Can you tell me something about that, Pau? Like, mm -hmm. how, how to get the right kind of experience early on? Yeah. Um, I think it does not matter much uh, where to get it. I, th I think what we don't want is to uh, to shed the, the, the first blood of a developer. No, like we want them uh, to at least have work before. Especially because we are small startups, and small startup every head uh, weighs a lot. So it's really really important that you hire uh, correctly. And I know that that sounds unfair, but I, I think for junior developers, maybe startup is not. It's not the best, uh, the best place because it's quite harsh and it's quite demanding. So uh, at least what I did in, my, uh, in the past and so on is I started working for bigger companies. There's still, uh, there's still a lot of big companies that they hire uh, a lot of developers and you can get your first experience there. Or also in open source, which is, uh, for me, I count it as experience. There's people that may not have worked in many places, but they've contributed a lot in open source. They, they had a lot of side projects and a lot of uh, uh, experience uh, building things and making them run. And that's what matters most. So what, what, what is an experienced developer? Is it possible to say what is an experienced developer? Is it one year, three years? Not, not by years, but yeah. more about uh, experiences. What have you done? Have you built a website? Uh, what kind of website? An e-commerce or, or what? Have you built, a, I don't know, a library or a image processing library, whatever, or, or a video game? Or I don't care what it is, but doing different things is what gets you experience. You may have do, done everything in one year or in five years. Uh, it's the, the amount of problems you've faced before, and that's mm -hmm. more or less how I would put it up mm -hmm. in, in any environment. Hmm. It doesn't have to be a job, it can yeah. be yourself uh, in your home, uh, working eight hours with uh, whatever it is, <laughs> this also counts. Hmm. Yeah, that's quite revolutionary for like work in general, mm -hmm. that's any kind of experience, not from like a consultancy or you know like a big famous company, as long as the experience is, is the core, whatever kind of experience. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that brings us a bit further because to, to, to become a developer, most of us, uh, or not us, but most of you, uh, either take a degree in university or go to maybe a hacker boot camp or something like that. And this is kind of the two, I don't know, places you go to to, to get an education. So uh, you both, you all hired a lot of different people. Uh, it's possible for you to say something about, about uh, you have hired some uh, people both from university, with university background yeah. and also like a hacker bootcamp background. Can you say something about, is, is there like a clear difference? Uh, it's, I think it's difficult to say. Um, university in this, case it's um, somehow helpful uh, it helps you um, have some deep understanding of certain issues that that are important and if you go quite deep in in, in some technological issues in some uh, in facing some problems sometime but for me it's not a, a requirement per se uh, I think it's way more more important uh, one, the talents and the motivation to go uh, further, to, to keep uh, pushing yourself and to keep improving and so on. And the other one is uh, the experience that, that Pau and Roger were talking about. Um, so in, in this case, um, I don't know, uh, it depends on, on the person. I, it absolutely mm. depends on the person. Um, Maybe if if someone just got out of of a bootcamp, hmm. uh, obviously you cannot uh, value the experience uh, because they had none or mostly uh, none. So uh, what I would value in these cases, uh, and we have hired uh, uh, people from bootcamps at Kipu, uh, what I would value is uh, motivation and and talent, and it's something. Sometimes difficult to, to spot, but uh, I think it's mm, it uh, makes sense. And in the medium long term, uh, this would make a good developer. Hmm. Uh, you you run a development team for for a long time. Uh, it got to be hard to keep the motivation up all the time. <laughs> what, what what is the key to, to you know keeping motivation high? Do you, do you have some you know some some uh, personal methods that you apply? Uh, in a general overview, it comes naturally if you keep working on the same product for many years. Uh, the natural evolution of the company and the product uh, leads to more complexity, and this leads to new problems uh, that need solving. And uh, this always ends up in new challenges for the people working there. Mm, apart from that, personally, we do a, a dev session every week uh, where we try to expand knowledge uh, and keep people more uh, involved in the in every part of the program. In the end, motivation is also personal, so for everyone it can be different. Uh, you don't know. Uh, maybe one day one person decides to start a company by himself. That happened, and then this person leaves. Uh, so it's a, a lot of a personal part uh, for the rest is uh, keeping an eye of uh, how you manage the complexity in your program and introducing new ways of solving this problem hmm. this right. keeps people motivated I think that leads us to the question because I think a lot of experienced developers and also developers out there are like aiming at becoming a CTO once in their career maybe mm -hmm. and you, you led several teams yeah. uh, you've been CTO several times uh, if you were to talk to someone now that you know, have had the aspiration of becoming a CTO uh, what should that person yeah. do? So that's, uh, that's a good question I, I actually have, uh, I don't only ask uh, developers to become a CTO. I think it's in general like some some skills that uh, developers usually do not uh, invest on, uh, which is the soft skills. And this is something I uh, always say on the one-on-ones when I talk to developers, uh, because I see it all the time. They invest a lot of time learning new technologies and following the the mastery of their of their craft, but they don't invest that much time on the soft skills. And that uh, comes from being able to discuss with someone and reach uh, a reasonable conclusion instead of just you know like facing one each other with their point of views, 
being able to convince people, being able to understand other people, being able to communicate. Uh, so all, all these skills are are usually not that um, that invested, and I think it really makes a difference. Because after all, um, when you're CDO, usually you're not the more talented uh, developer in the team, like most of the times. And if you are, maybe uh, you know, like you could up your game with hiring. But uh, but I think you value it uh, in the interaction, especially when when you work with management team. That is really really important. Hmm. And uh, we we all heard there, there's like different uh, you know uh, developer stereotypes you know uh, brought by like uh, TV shows you know have Silicon Valley and all of these you know stereotypes of of developers uh, that get portrayed by the media. But uh, uh, is there is there you know stereotypes in amongst developers? Do they exist? Is it that uh, you know clear? Is it possible to say you are developers yourself? So maybe it's a bit hard to 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 say, but you know, I, I I think so. I mean, I think one thing developers have in common is that they are really rational. So you will find always uh, when you discuss with uh, with developers or when you discuss with other people, uh, they tend to be extremely rational because the way we have to look at problems, we analyze them, and we have to understand how the world works. And then uh, developers get really upset when. Uh, if you tell them you 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 have to do this because you have to do it, uh, they they want to do it. They need the rational explanation. Mm. So in that sense, they they are made a lot of jokes, uh, you know, around developers because sometimes uh, they get too extreme. But that I, I would say that this one is the one that holds true always. Yeah. Exactly. They're passionate and hard with their opinions, and that's what makes them good developers. No? Mm. To have a strong point and keep it, unless someone else. Uh, has a, very, a more good argument or a different kind of argument that he accepts. Hmm. Yeah. So, so should everyone code, or should you be uh, belong to this kind of you know personality? If if you if you're like a, I, I don't think either. I mean, uh, I don't think everyone should code, but I don't think that uh, the only people that should code uh, uh, should be these uh, with this specific set of abilities. I mean, it depends. Uh, as with every profession and with every um, way of doing things, mm, hmm. I think yeah. that uh, everyone uh, uh, is not uh, able to, to do every job. I, I couldn't be, mm, I don't know, uh, maybe a politician or uh, <laughs> maybe uh, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be a, a doctor because I'm afraid of blood. So. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, looking a bit forward, uh, if you're a developer right now, maybe in education or, or looking to get into developing uh, projects, what kind of technology or, uh, should uh, you know a developer uh, you know look into learn? Uh, Roger, you're, you're you're working on some new projects right now. Uh, if if a developer would to come and and be hired by you in in one year, what kind of like uh, what what should he know? What is like his? Uh, is it, it's a big question, maybe? But uh, yeah, but it depends a lot on the on the product and sure. everything. Sure. In the end, it's not about one specific technology. Right. Right now, we have Ruby, Python, uh, JavaScript. Uh, there are lots of things. Mm. Well, JavaScript, you may say, is a good one to know in mm. for many reasons. Right. Right. So, uh, is, is it the same for you? Do you think? Yeah. The same? I mean, I. I, I do think JavaScript is the thing to learn uh, in general because it's versatile. So the problem right now is that you know if you do backend, you have a set of two or three technologies that are more or less uh, being used. If you use frontend, you have to use uh, JavaScript or one well, pseudo JavaScript or something that transpiles too. But more or less, you end up always with JavaScript. And if you do mobile, you either have to to do Swift or, or Java. So it's it's very difficult for a for a founder uh, or for a small company to hire developers to match all these positions because you would still need uh, at least one backend, at least one frontend, at least one mobile. If you happen to have, uh, you know, like mobile apps and so on, and if you want to go native in both, you need one one native Android and one. So it's it's a lot of hassle. So JavaScript likely have technologies to cover all of it. 
um, you know, like you may be more fun or, or less, but I think it's the most versatile skill right now. Because mm -hmm. if you want to, you can cover uh, up to these four positions. Right. And as we're talking about uh, JavaScript and, and, and different topics, uh, about, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, front-end frameworks has, you know, been coming the last years and uh, and are probably going to come for the next years. Uh, uh, do you see that, like, uh, one or other, uh, like, one, one of the or the other frameworks that have been coming out lately now, uh, you know, will prevail and be, like, the, the one people will use? Or, or do you think that uh, uh, there will like come one tomorrow, and that will be like the the new new thing. The new thing. What, what, what do you think, Roche? It's hard to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Given the last few years, <laughs> right now uh, React seems to be the the most common one, but you never know what will be in the future. I mean, uh, I I'm not comfortable saying that React will be the the de facto technology two years in the future. Hmm. I don't know. I've heard you, Pao, been pretty like passionate about React. Yeah, um, yeah. One year ago, I, I made my predictions: in Backbone will disappear, Angular will keep up, Ember will keep being niche, and React will dominate. Uh, I'm a, uh, that was a good prediction. <laughs> and actually, uh, last week there was the state of JavaScript. There's a, a poll that they they release every every year, and and yeah, React is, is leading is leading the way right now. Um, as Roger said, you know, we were thinking the same about Backbone three years ago, and we never know what's going to come. But uh, it's on my interest also to defend React because I invested in it on my company, so I want to keep up uh, the illusion that everything is going to be React in the future. <laughs> Uh, Albert, uh, is it possible to to, to ask you um, to, to a bit of a different question? But uh, you know, what what is the most mature technology stack you would use for a critical project right now? The most mature? Yeah, if it's possible to ask. Uh, if I would have to start it, so it would I would be in charge of it. Yeah, right. Uh, I would use the tools that I'm most familiar with, which are Rails backends and. Uh, Hmm. Um, like an old school uh, front end and so on. Um, I don't know. I think it depends on the on the tools that you are most familiar with. And in the end, um, some people think that uh, they have to keep uh, adding new shiny tools every every year. Uh, I don't think so. I think mm, it depends on every person first, uh, but also mm, some technology that you know how it's going to behave in every situation and that you're very familiar with and you have a lot of experience with it, that's fantastic. I mean, you you don't have to uh, to worry about uh, strange behaviors or some, some things that you haven't uh, you haven't uh, played with it. So hmm. yeah. Yeah, well. I, I agree that you have to uh, always use things that are mature and that you control and so on. But there's, there's uh, something that worked pretty well uh, in the past for us, uh, that is that in order to attract uh, developers, uh, and you know, unlucky, you have to sometimes put the shiny things in front of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so uh, mastery is a big thing for developers. So happy developers, a developer, and, and Roger said himself, I, I don't have time to keep up with technology and I would love to. So sometimes you have to make trade-offs and, and you may, for instance, you may choose a more solid technology on the back end and be a little bit conservative there, but you may want to get a little bit shiny on the front end or vice versa. Like at Redwood, for instance, when we were team box back then, I remember we managed to hire really good people uh, like Mislav, for instance, which is a well-known uh, person in the Ruby community, because we were one of the first companies in, in Barcelona that was investing on Ruby and Rails. So that uh, gave us access to good developers that would come to a smaller company and maybe being paid less than a big corporation doing PHP or Java because we were using the, the shiny thing. So I think you need to measure well the, those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true, but that's something you can do when you introduce a technology. Once you have a technology running for one year, you can you, you can manage you know you, if you empower if if you empower your your developers uh, uh, towards the road of mastery, uh, one thing we do at Red Booth, for instance, we dedicate uh, one week every every six weeks, 
uh, and you give the developers you know the time to do whatever they want and uh, they will upgrade the versions they will put that framework they will put that you know like because they want to play with it and when you give them the time they will find the time to introduce the shiny the shiny thing in, in your project the problem is when you don't give them the time there's never uh, then you you never have time to to, to, to do these things yeah you think it's necessary though to to give your developers a bit of time every month or every quarter to to be creative to you know have their yeah. own time i think i think so uh especially for for motivation we we had uh, in the past, very successful uh, features and experiments with that. I wouldn't say the return has been spectacular. Like sometimes it's it's really good, sometimes it's it's just some technical depth. But overall, uh, for the productivity and the, and the motivation of the team, that's uh, I think it's great. How, how are you doing that, Roger, uh, in in Kamaloon? Are your employees or your development team? Do you have any time to? We're not doing that specifically, uh, but we do give uh, extremely freedom to everyone uh, to solve the problem at hand. Uh, I mean, there's no, we don't have persons working in one specific part. Uh, it's the contrary. Uh, one person has to develop a project or solve something or implement a feature, and it's up to them how to accomplish the goal. So, so free uh, freedom is the word here. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. So, uh, uh, as we uh, we're running a bit out of time, uh, but you know, as as everything goes digital these days, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering because I'm not a developer my, myself. Uh, do you guys think it it it, it uh, you need to know how to to code, how to how to you know, to be a developer, how to, to to understand the world around us? As as you know, the Internet of Things, everything gets connected. You know, will you like as as our grandparents, you know, lag behind because they don't know a cell phone these days. You know, will it be the same in twenty years if you if you don't know how to code, you don't know how your you know uh, your uh, internet connected Levi's work. You know, uh, will should should everyone learn to code? Is my question actually? Yeah, I I think I I could draw. A uh, a parallelism with electricity, you know, like before there was no electricity and when electricity came, not everybody became an electrician. So it's useful and sometimes at home you wish you had this knowledge, you know, because you could fix these, these things or, or these others. Uh, I think with coding it's the same, it's just mm. uh, revolutionary technology that solves some problems and if you have the skill you can do things that you couldn't do before. I'm not really sure though that everybody needs to, to see how the sausage is made. So. So we just have to trust you guys. Of course, that's uh, <laughs> that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, we're running out of time, but thank you all for for being here, for participating, sharing some of your knowledge, uh, and uh, good luck in all of your projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.